Well, thank you for coming to listen to me. Uh, I, as a, as um, as Ashika said, I'm, I'm Alex Ellery. I'm at Carlton University. Uh, and a few years ago, I started looking at the possibility of building self-replicating machines uh, and asking the question of whether they are a technology of to tomorrow or of today. And I hope to persuade you uh, during this talk that they're a, they're a technology of today. So why self-replication? Well, in my opinion, the self-replication is the only robust approach to space exploration that can circumvent launch costs. And I'll explain how this works in a moment. So the key to what self-replication provides is, is the ability to grow productive capacity exponentially. Um, <clears throat> so if you can imagine each, each cell or each unit is a factory, <clears throat> um, then uh, basically you can ex rapidly expand, exponentially expand your, your productive capacity by multiplying your factories. So let's take an example. Uh, if we, if we take, let's say, a 10 ton self-replicating factory to the moon, now current, you know, current costs imposed by Moon Express, this would cost you about $7.5 billion to send 10 tons onto the surface of the moon. Now, with self-replication, uh, the cumulative population of these units grows to over one and a half million within just 13 generations. So your initial capital cost of $7.5 billion has been amortized over this exponentially increasing productive capacity. Now, if we take two offspring per, genera per generation, over 13 generations, the specific cost to the moon has dropped from $750,000 per ki kilogram, which is the moon express rates, to less than 50 cents per kilogram of productive capacity. So if each 10 ton factory takes six months to build, we essentially could have one and a half million factories in just 6.5 years on the surface of the moon. Now, each of each of these, uh, you know, million factories produces a thousand solar power satellites. When I talk about solar power satellites, I talk about smaller ones. Uh, we could have potentially uh, a billion solar power satellite units uh, built uh, extremely rapidly. And I'll talk about that right at the very end. So we could potentially supply our global energy needs uh, entirely cleanly without any CO2 production at all from space. But the point is the self-replication effectively sidesteps launch costs. So all these, all, all these attempts to try and reduce launch costs, they reduce them by an order of magnitude or maybe a little bit more, but this actually really, really knocks it on the head that essentially launch costs become almost irrelevant. So where does the self-replication come from? Uh, it was originally proposed by John von Neumann, uh, the great Hungarian mathematician. Uh, and what he devised uh, in the 1950s was the, uh, a theoretical framework which suggested that a sufficient but not necessary condition for self-replication is something called universal construction. Now, the universal constructor is a kinematic machine that can copy, that can manufacture any other machine, including a copy of itself, given the appropriate resources, energy, and, inf and instructions. So the universal constructor is a kind of generalization of uh, the universal Turing machine. It was well known that von Neumann and, and Turing knew each other uh, when Turing was at Princeton uh, before the war, before the Second World War. So the universal constructor is kind of idealized in, in von Neumann's framework uh, as a kind of programmable generalized kinematic arm in a sea of parts. So this would represent a structured environment. If we want to adapt this to an unstructured environment, we have to consider that the, the universal constructor comprises a suite of kinematic machines from load haul dumpers, and drills for mine as mining robots, programmable pumps for driving chemical processes, mills, lathes, 3D printers, and manipulators. So uh, when we translate a, this theoretical concept into the real world, uh, it becomes much more complex. But the, the common feature of all these machines is that they are all specific kine, kinematic configurations of electric motors. And the core to every single one of these machines, it, oh, like this. the core to every single one of these machines is the, is the sensory motor control system comprising motors, computational electronics and sensors, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So imagine we're on the moon. Well, the moon has a, uh, has 
uh, a relatively simple geology, pyroxene, pludgy clays, primarily a northite, olivine, ilmenite. Uh, how do we manufacture the stuff that we need on the on the right hand side of the on, on, on the right hand side of the slide the table? Uh, so we have various particular types of functional uh, uh, materials. Um, let's say, for example, look at electrical conduction. We can use uh, potentially Fernico, which is a is a, such as cobalt, which is a kind of iron alloy uh, of nickel and cobalt. Uh, we can use pure nickel. We can use aluminium. But essentially on the right hand column shows that essentially 10 basic materials are required to supply the full functionality that we require to build a simple robotic spacecraft. From Earth, we can source the vast, we can source all these materials from the moon, uh, but we would need to uh, supply a minimal set of reagents from Earth uh, because sodium and chlorine are extremely rarefied on the moon and these could be imported from Earth. Now in terms of the, what seems to be a disadvantage, actually we can turn to advantage because it provides us with a means for, for preventing uncontrolled replication and this I've called the salt contingency. Uh, one of the things that now the universal construction must be supplied with appropriate resources to self-replicate matter, energy, information but the most important constraints are what are known as the closure conditions. So if you can imagine uh, a mobile phone, um, you take it apart and you look at each component in turn. And then beneath that, you also look at uh, every single uh, material that's made, that's made out of. And so a whole host of processes need to be coordinated to put that telephone together. Now, in order, so basically there's a fan there's a there's a, uh, a wide range of series fan in to this one component now in order to control the complexity we need to control uh, the materials the energy and the information actually that goes into uh, our self-replicator and the first is materials and parts closure so every component has a portfolio of materials processes and machines required for its manufacture so if we want to close the matter loop, we need to minimize the amount of mining we have to do and minimize the chemical processing that we have to do. And this is where the demand art, le demand art list comes in that you saw a moment ago. I'll introduce you to the industrial ecology in a minute and uh, various other and a couple of other chemical processing techniques. We also need to restrict the parts inventory to minimize the manufacturing and assembly costs. And this is where 3D printing comes in and I'll talk about that in a moment. There's also an energy closure issue. Uh, the uh, the energy gener generated must exceed the cost of the energy to build, and this on Earth this is now in in uh, in on Earth this is known as uh, energy return on investment. Uh, so to close the energy loop, we need to maximise the use of d direct environmental energy, uh, for example, solar energy and thermal energy. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, we want to maximise electrical energy conversion efficiency. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of energy wasted in processing waste. So by eliminating waste, we actually reduce the amount of process, the energy required for processing. And this is where the industrial ecology comes in. And we also need to restrict, uh, ensure that all processes minimize the energy, energy consumption. And, and an example of this is the uh, metallicis FFC process and 3D printing also. And the final part is information closure. Uh, which I don't really want to talk about too much because that's a whole field in itself. But essentially, you don't, you can't have the the information required to specify the self-replicator cannot exceed the capacity of your storage space within the self-replicator. So, in order to, do, to to implement this, we maximise parts reuse, and this is known as adaptation in biology. And basically, it minimises the information required to build the. the uh, build the self-replicator. So for example, electric motors could be co-opted as well as actuation. They can be co-opted for energy storage as flywheels and vacuum tubes, for example, uh, for computation could be uh, co-opted for energy conversion. We'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, so the first step in the process is lunar mining. Um, we built uh, a few years ago uh, a, a, a micro rover called Katvik. 
Um, it was implement. It basically had a JCP type uh, 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 manipulator um, with a scoop. Uh, it was capable of autonomous navigation. It uses various techniques implemented on, on FPGA technology. It had a reconfigurable chassis. Uh, it had a sensorized chassis. So, for example, uh, uh, by measuring the loads on each wheel, we could extract things like the soil soil cohesion and the soil friction angle as we were driving. Um, and of course, the, the the rover itself was capable of abseiling. Uh, this is the rover undergoing uh, field trials at the um, Canadian Space Agency's Mars Yard a few years ago, and that was built uh, as part of Carlton was part of a large team, uh, but essentially it was uh, Carlton's design, the, the basic uh, design. So we've mined this material. Uh, the first step is to extract volatiles, and we can do this by heating the regolith to 700 degrees. This will release about 90% of the volatiles. Uh, now, the, the most valuable, most valuable uh, materials on the moon are going to be derived from these, uh, um, these scarce volatiles, carbon compounds, nitrogen compounds, uh, not so much sulfur compounds because they could be sourced elsewhere, but certainly carbon compounds would be are potentially extremely useful. Now, from these volatiles that we, 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 we extract off, we can then fractionally distill them and actually each component actually is well separated uh, in terms of its condensation temperature. So uh, demonstrating this kind of uh, fractional distillation could be relatively straightforward. And in fact, we're developing at the moment a tuned diode laser absorption spectrometer with Magellan uh, to basically analyze uh, volatiles um, from the lunar surface, uh, impact, uh, basically delivered by penetrator. And part of the process will be to, to essentially have a, a temperature schedule which condenses each species in turn. And this, of course, would be a, like an ISIU type of uh, demonstrator. Uh, another important material is ceramics. Uh, fused silica glass is extremely useful. This could be adopted for electrical insulation of cables. Another ceramic is porcelain. Amazingly enough, one of the byproducts of our, of our um, industrial lunar ecology is, is kaolinite, uh, which is a clay which can be used to, which can be fired into porcelain. And again, this is used in electrical insulation uh, known as knob and tube technology. Um, for electrical distribution and bases, for example, but for uh, but for um, for systems that that undergo loads, uh, you probably don't want to use ceramics. You probably want to use something more flexible, and silicone plastics offers a uh, offers a possibility. Now, the advantage of silicone plastics is that the silicon silicon oxygen backbone minimizes the amount of carbon that you consume. Uh, it's also highly radi uh, UV radi uh, radiation resistant, has a much higher operational temperature than normal plastics, up to about 350 degrees. That can actually be increased to much higher temperatures with certain additives. Uh, and it can be used only sparingly for flexible wire sheathing. Uh, it is relative, it's a well known process for uh, deriving from skin, syn, syn, syn gas uh, to uh, PDMS, which is the commonest and simplest siloxin. Uh, using the rock out process. Uh, the HCL involved, of course, is recycled. That's not consumed. Uh, and so, again, the, the chlorine that we require from Earth is not actually consumed in the product itself. So in the Maria regions, there's plentiful ilmenite. Uh, we can take the ilmenite heat at 1,000 degrees uh, in the presence of hydrogen. And this will produce uh, iron metal um, rutile and water. The water can be split into hydrogen, uh, which is recycled, and the oxygen can be, be used for supporting people, uh, or, or as the oxidant component of pellet. The iron can be separated from the uh, rutile by heating it until it liquefies at 1600 degrees. This is actually a very, very well established technique. Now, with certain additives from this iron, we can create a number of different alloys. Pure iron itself is actually relatively tough uh, and malleable. It could be used for tensile structures. Uh, cast iron, we probably wouldn't use, um, but I mentioned it there. Uh, 
because uh, it is used for compressive structures and actually the iron bridge uh, in Colebrookdale in the UK withstood English weather for 200 years before it, uh, more than 200 years before it. So this is a demonstration that uh, the iron itself is actually very, uh, can even survive a, a highly aggressive corrosive environment over long periods. Uh, we can manufacture tool steel for cutting stool, cutting tools if we can find uh, tungsten. Uh, we can create things like electrical steel uh, with the addition of uh, uh, small amounts of silicon, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And we can manufacture things like uh, alloys like Kovar, um, nickel, cobalt, and a few other little bits and pieces go in there. And the permaloy, of course, is, uh, is used for magnetic shielding. So to make our alloys, we need to source tungsten, nickel, and cobalt. Uh, now, it's known that around about 25% uh, of lunar impacting materials survives at impact, particularly for, for shallow impacts. Uh, and these can be located uh, through, well, through several, re so several mechanisms. One of them potentially is VASCONS. Um, and one location has been identified at the northern rim of the South Pole Aitken crater. Now, nickel iron meteorites are dominated by camasite and tinite, uh, and these are nickel iron alloys and typically contaminated with cobalt. So these are the materials required. Now, the MOND process or the carbonyl process is a low temperature process, which allows you to extract individual components of these alloys uh, and then purify, and purify them and then recondense them. And we can apply this actually to not just uh, um, uh, nickel, which I've suggested here, you can also apply it to iron and for cobalt as well. It requires a, a, a sulfur catalyst, uh, but this can be extracted from troilite, which of course is, is, is usually, is basically is common in, in uh, such meteorites, meteoritic material. Now, if we can actually extract things like aluminium and cobalt, this introduces the possibility of creating permanent magnets such as uh, made from uh, alloys such as alnico. Uh, and I'll talk about aluminium in a minute. And finally, uh, tungsten is uh, something we're going to need small amounts of. Uh, these exist in much as microparticle inclusions, which can be crushed and separated. Tungsten obviously has an extremely high density and a very high melting temperature, which offers two possibilities for its extraction. I want to talk a little bit about sensors. Um, before, I want to talk about sensors, motor sensors, actuators. Uh, and control systems essentially as we go as we move on. So displacement sensing is the most fundamental mode of sensing. Uh, the simplest method is the use, use of a potentiometer, which is basically a resistance wire in a voltage divider configuration. And rotary potentiometers are widely used in, you know, robotics uh, in high radiation environments. So we use them on CatVic, for example, for the rocker bogey link angle, angle measurements. Um, so resistance wire is simply electrical conducting wire. Aluminium uh, can be used for this purpose. And this can be extracted from lunar anorthite. Now anorthite is a very common mineral in the lunar highlands. Uh, and what we can apply is essentially an artificial weathering process. So we use our imported, well, we, we, we've imported salt. We can convert that into HCl acid. We can heat that. And what through a two stage, well, actually through a three stage process, I've only listed uh, just uh, two stages here. Uh, we can actually extract uh, silica, uh, which is precipitated out from silicic acid. And we can also uh, precip precipitate out uh, alumina as well. Now, alumina itself is extremely useful uh, by itself. It's used in crucible linings. It has physical properties only exceeded only by diamond. Uh, silica is a raw material used for generating fused silica glass. One of the problems with trying to manufacture glass from uh, lunar minerals directly is that they tend to have iron in them, and iron makes them dark, uh, so it makes them useless for optical purposes. So fused silica glass can be used for that purpose. So we want to be able to manufacture Fresnel lenses, for example. Now, one of the byproducts of this is uh, calcium chloride, uh, and this basically is the electrolyte used for the FFC process, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so it provides a mechanism for replenishing that. <clears throat> uh, now together, alumina and silica may be, although they have utility in itself, they can also be re reduced directly into aluminium metal uh, 
and silicon conduct, uh, semiconductor uh, directly uh, using the FFC process. Now, the FFC process is a very powerful process. It's an electrolytic process, uh, relatively low temperature, 900 to 1100 degrees uh, centigrade. It comprises a cathode, uh, which is essentially the metal oxide, uh, which has been crushed and sintered uh, into a, a shape, uh, which is immersed into the electrolyte at this temperature. Uh, the, the electrolyte is, is liquid, but the, the actual uh, ceramic itself is not liquid. Uh, so there's no melting of liquids or, or, or metals in this process. And at the anode, you have uh, um, a graph, uh, uh, an, uh, an anode. Now there are various options for the anode. It can, there are options for non-eroding. Um, the, currently, most of the anodes uh, used are graphite, which do erode uh, to produce C CO or CO2. Uh, but this also is potentially re recyclable through the Sabatier process, followed by thermal cracking. The product, uh, if you look at the pictures there on the left-hand side, that's, uh, this is with uh, rutile, for example, was uh, a sintered rutile cathode there. Um, after the process, it yielded uh, titanium metal powder which was then passed through a selective laser sintering um, a 3D printer, and these test articles were printed. So we're starting to shape, see the shape of a process of where we go from raw materials into a final product. Now, the metal another advantage of the metallysis FFC process, it requires 90%, 97% thermal heating and only 3% electrolytic energy. What this translates as is that rather than generating electrical energy with with large energy losses uh, to heat the uh, he, to heat the electrolyte, um, a more direct approach would be to use something like the uh, Fresnel lenses to heat the electrolyte directly from solar energy. That would be far more efficient. Uh, what I mentioned before, just a couple of things. This is uh, the it's a very busy slide. I, I understand. Uh, this is the lunar industrial ecology, where we're trying to construct uh, all the materials we need to build uh, some kind of robotic machines of various kinds on the moon. Uh, we have the ilmenite here, which I mentioned. I talked about the uh, Mond process uh, here. Olivine, I haven't really mentioned, but this gives us access to magnesium. We have uh, an orthite, which I just mentioned, volatiles I mentioned, and these. this, of course, is the, um, uh, the imported material from Earth, the NACL. Uh, which is then processed to create the various materials, reagents that we need to support the other processes. And there's a uh, orthoclase also is uh, another material that we uh, need, and a byproduct, of course, is calminite. Uh, the point to note is that uh, it would be too. If I tried to draw all the arrows to where things feed into each other, it would just be it'd just be a big, huge globular mess. Um, but essentially, this this uh, ecology is is pretty much self-contained. Uh, there are well-established inputs. Uh, there are X number of inputs. The outputs are relatively small. Most of it is recycled uh, and can be used directly into product. There's very, very little waste in this. So let's move on to 3D printing. Uh, we, I started looking at this uh, partly because I got a 3D, uh, the RepRap 3D printer a number of years ago. Uh, many of you may, may be familiar with it. It can print many of its own plastic parts. Um, now, if we take the rep wrap as our starting point, um, the bits in white essentially were printed by its daddy. Um, how do we extend this self-replication process to incorporate the entire machine? Well, we'd need to uh, print the, the metal bars and the, uh, you know other other metal components. And we have there are techniques to do this: uh, selective laser sintering uh, or selective laser melting or electron beam additive manufacturing, all can, do, can deal with metals. Uh, we need to have joinery for all the nuts and bolts uh, that uh, are actually on this device. Uh, but a lot of these can be replaced with cement or adhesive. What we're looking at is the hard parts, which are how do we 3D print things like the electric motor drives, the electronics boards, and the computer hardware and software. In addition to incorporate full self-replication, we also need to uh, have some kind of mechanism for self-assembly. Uh, and this here is um, 
out of Johns Hopkins University. This is an idea for a, a, a self-replicator, and a, which is set, which is an assembly machine. So it's like a, a 3D printer where the head, printhead, has been replaced by some kind of wrist assembly. Um, so essentially, this means motors. Uh, we also have to consider power, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and material processing into feedstock, which we've just uh, looked at. So my argument is that if we can 3D print electric motors and electronics, everything else will follow. And in fact, this is exactly what we've been doing. We've been uh, three, this is just the, 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 five, the last in a number of different prototypes. Uh, we believe this is the first fully 3D printed electric motor. Um, it was printed primarily from something called protopasta, the rotor was. Uh, the permanent magnets were manufactured for us at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The, um, and the copper wiring was manufactured using uh, a technique called laminated object manufacturing. These were, but the whole thing was assembled by hand. Again, the shaft and the, and the bearings were also, also 3D, 3D printed. So this shows you uh, the 3D printed motor in action. Uh, it'll get there eventually. So this is it there. So again, I can't, I can't stress this enough. Every single component in that was uh, underwent some kind of 3D printing. Although I, we must confess we had to assemble it by hand. So let's, uh, that's the motor. Uh, let's look at um, another type of sensor we might need is some kind of vision sensor. Uh, and the imaging is fairly fundamental if you're going to do robotics as a remote sensing, uh, remote sensing technique. Now, one possible, rather than actually use uh, sort of like the current approach, which uses uh, um, uh, PN junctions and so on, uh, we one possibility is to use selenium, which is a semiconductor that was used in the Victorian photophone uh, by which one of the inventions by Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, it's a T-type -type semiconductor, uh, and this uh, it's basically light sensitive. So silica, so selenium is found in association with uh, metal sulfides. Uh, in metal sulfides, of course, occur on the moon in nickel ion meteorites in the form of troilite. And the, it can be, the selenium can be extracted by uh, smelting with soda, which is uh, sodium chloride and saltpeter. And uh, through a series of processes, um, selenium can be liberated. So this provides us with our um, photosensitive material. Uh, and again, because we need to use uh, uh, sodium, this is part of the salt contingency uh, uh, because sodium is very rare on the moon. And again, the sodium is not consumed. Now, if we can make, if we can actually extract selenium, we can potentially manufacture photomultiplier tubes. And I've written a paper about this actually, which is essentially a vacuum tube where the primary emitter is coated, coated with selenium and the secondary emitters are coated with either alumin, uh, alumina or magnesium oxide. So we've also been looking at uh, building, uh, well, 3D printing in a, in a more general context, not just extrusion. Uh, all 3D printers comprise the same process. Essentially you've got an XY printing head uh, with a Z, Z moving deposition table. Uh, so essentially, 3D printers are Cartesian robots. For me, as a roboticist, that's uh, that's uh, quite. I treat 3D printers as robots, essentially. Uh, and we're interested in two technologies. One is uh, selective solar, solar sintering, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the other one is EBAM, which is electron beam additive manufacturing. Now we've been developing uh, selective solar, solar sintering using our Fresnel lens. So the idea is that the Fresnel lens. We, is used as a solar concentrator for generating thermal energy. And we actually have a, a two meter square um, Fresnel lens, which is capable of generating up to 1500 degrees spot temperatures. Um, and the idea is what, what we want to do is feed that, that spot temperature into a quartz rod and then feed that through fiber optic clay cabling and then allow us to move ahead on a Cartesian uh, on a Cartesian frame, uh, and thereby generate create this kind of like solar powered three um, D printer, uh, which can potentially melt metal. Uh, 
Uh, we're in the process of building that. I'll talk, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Electron beam additive manufacturing is ba based on the electron gun, which is essentially a high va voltage vacuum tube. Um, it can only melt metals though. Um, it, can't, it can't melt uh, plastics and it can't melt uh, ceramics. However, um, as I'll speak, talk in a moment, we can deal with ceramics in an alternative way and plastics we don't have much of on the moon anyway. We can, we can, we can, we can process them using extrusion. So we're currently building, I don't know what these videos are, I can't remember what they are then. Oh yeah. Uh, so moving into our 3D printer, the, the business end of the 3, 3, 3D printer, we've been building uh, a 3D printer frame. We actually have it here, it's motorized and everything and it works. Uh, and what we're currently doing is trying to fit heads on it. Now we've done some experiments with a smaller Fresnel lens for melting aluminium alloy. Um, and what we found is that we can actually melt aluminium alloy onto uh, silicone plastic um, because silicone plastic is actually tolerant to, the, to, to melting uh, of um, the, the temperatures of melting for aluminium alloy. So this actually introduced some interesting possibilities because what it means is that we, um, at the bottom here, we actually have our silicone plastic extruder. We can actually lay a layer of silicone plastic and then lay aluminium powder on top and then melt that thermally. Um, we, we're currently still working on this, but we demonstrated the, basic, the basics of it. Now in our printer, we want to add two heads to demonstrate this. One is a, our thermal fiber optic head using solar energy to melt aluminium. And the second one is our silicone plastic extrusion head. The next phase after that will be to add a third head, which is a milling head to allow us to mill whatever we print. And the third phase will add a wrist, uh, as we saw Mos the, the, the Moses uh, design uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Im implements essentially a wrist. And then the final phase will be to migrate to see steels and ceramics. Now the key behind this is to, is to print silicone plastic, flash heat it in oxygen, that will drive off the carbon, carbon dioxide, and that will leave a layer of silica ceramic. And onto that, we then be able, be able to melt steels. And we could repeat that process in, in alternately. So that is the idea is that we can start to introduce like high temperature steels uh, with ceramic through 3D printing. So, Next thing is to look at is electronics. Now, uh, we've opted for vacuum tubes. Uh, these are still used uh, for twitters on spacecraft. They're more to radiation tolerant than solid state uh, devices. They have a relatively simple construction that would be potentially printable. We haven't demonstrated this yet. Um, they, they comprise of very small number of materials. They use have a covar resistance wire, uh, a, a tungsten cathode coated with cal calcium oxide, um, and a nickel anode and control grid in a, in, a, in a glass envelope. We can manufacture all those pieces from lunar material. Now, if we built a modern day computer uh, out of vacuum tubes, it would be, an, it'd be the size of a block of flats. Uh, so for example, Colossus, which was built at Bellexley Park, uh, comprised of 2,400 vacuum tubes it was designed in, and, and it was by the great and unsung Tommy Flowers. I'm a big fan of Tommy Flowers. I think he's, he, he's, uh, he's an unappreciated engineer, uh, but that's another story. But so you can imagine that if we start to build a CPU out of, um, out of vacuum tubes, it would be huge. Uh, if you look at ENIAC, for example, that had 17,000 vacuum tubes and that occupied a large room. If we try and build an 8086 uh, CPU, it would be the size of a building. I'm talking about multi-story building. And modern CPUs are even more complex. So these can't be implemented using vacuum tubes. So maybe there's another approach. We can, we, rather than actually having using a single purpose, general purpose architecture, we can uh, look at having a distributed set of computational devices uh, of specialized circuits. Uh, and we can implement them in neural networks. And now neural networks grow logarithmically in size with task size rather than exponentially. 
uh, if you had a CPU. So this controls the gro circuit growth uh, in terms of the complexity of what we want to achieve. Now, recurrent neural nets are also Turing equivalent. Um, and in fact, what we're trying to implement is a direct model of, of the, Tur the original Turing machine, where the input tape is now magnetic core memory. Magnetic core memory has the same components as a motor, where our output tape becomes the analog neural network circuits, which I'll show you in a moment. And the read-write he head is simply the 3D printer itself. So basically the magnetic core memory is read by the, th by the 3D printer, which prints out these, uh, these uh, neural circuits. And we've adopted a, a Yamashita Nakaruma uh, circuit uh, that you see on the right here. This is actually fixed weight um, and this is it Basically, these, this was two neurons only. Oh, where's that one? Oh, it's not working. I don't know why. Um, uh, the, basically, this rover implemented uh, um, a uh, simple obstacle avoidance capability, but it had no computer control. It was just simply two, two uh, YN neurons. We've also been looking at uh, trying to implement back propagation learning in the circuitry rather than software. Most people do it in software. But we're trying to implement it in circuit form and uh, we've done some for oh that doesn't work either why is, why is that okay. anyway anyway this demonstrated that it was basically we trained it to go up to the to the barrier and then simply stop uh, very simple very simple but it demonstrated that we could teach the robot the, the rover to to do this using circuits rather than software Future work, well, one of the things I want to do next is to 3D print a magnetron. Uh, it's a vacuum tube, uh, which comprises of various motor elements like magnets and cooling fins. You can see the cooling fins here, made out of aluminium. Um, we, we also want to implement a technique for de directly thermal heating of the cathode, which I don't want to talk about too much now, I'm conscious of time. Um, but the magnetron, of course, is the centerpiece of this solar power satellite, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, it also introduces uh, further processes for self-replication. We can, uh, we can uh, 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 microwave processing of regolith. Uh, we can use uh, microwave uh, technique for PN junction doping, uh, and also potentially for scientific analysis um, using a variation of LIBS, uh, except using micro microwaves. Uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, yeah, um, so we're at 11.50. Um, I think we can leave a five to 10 minute Q&A session, um, but you can go on until 11.50. Okay, all uh, right. Yeah, okay. so five more minutes. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that we can exact uh, our motors and our vacuum tubes for other purposes to try and reduce the amount of information load that we need to implement. Uh, and one approach is to use thermionic conversion uh, in vacuum tubes um, as our means of generating electricity. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but essentially we can coat uh, calcium oxide and alumina uh, onto our cathode, our tungsten cathode, um, and essentially generate thermionic conversion of electricity. Now, this has a, an efficiency of about 10 to 15 percent. Now, potentially, we can increase this by incorporating uh, potassium vapor uh, within the vacuum tube. We can minimize the interelectrode distance. Uh, we can also shape the electrostatic field within the device as well. And the, this potentially can, can, in theory, increase the efficiency to about 40%. There is also an additional technique called photon enhanced thermionic conversion which adds another stage to this, which can potentially increase the uh, conversion efficiency to 50%. Uh, and we can use silicon for that, for that purpose. We can also add a third stage using thermoelectric conversion, though this is unlikely to give us very much, since this is only a few percent, but certainly a conservative est estimate of, you know, using these, some of these techniques can give us a, a, certainly a, a, a conversion efficiency of 30%. And that is much better than proposals for uh, manufacturing uh, photovoltaic cells from lunar material. 
um, which you typically are about 5% maximum uh, conversion efficiency, primarily due to the problem of doping. What about storage? Well, two week night on, on the moon, uh, you, you, you need to supply energy during the nighttime and this can be accomplished using flywheels. They're offer, uh, they offer uh, zero uh, depth of discharge. Uh, they give you a relatively good, they give you a high density of, of energy storage, reasonably good power density. And depending on the material, uh, the material determines what speed we can, we can run the wheel at. And if we run it at gla with glass, again, we can manufacture uh, a few silica glass from the lunar material. We can get up to 100 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, we can also incorporate things like uh, silicon as elastomers uh, when we construct them as hoops to try and reduce the radial stresses. Uh, we would put them into a Halbach motor configuration um, with uh, frictionless magnetic bearings. And again, we've seen how we can, we can manufacture magnets uh, from the moon. So uh, we essentially can build everything we need for a flywheel uh, using uh, lunar derived material. Uh, the, one, of my one of my undergraduate students in one of my courses, uh, I run a course called Vehicle Engineering 2, uh, part of which is to have an individual project. Um, I'm very much against the idea of burning lunar water. Uh, it's a non-renewable source. People are talking about extracting water ice from the, uh, from the poles and then basically splitting it and using it as cryogenic propellant. I think this is a waste. Um, to con I think we're making the same mistakes as we made on Earth. Uh, and I think it's wrong to burn this. There is an alternative technique, which is to use solar energy to support an electromagnetic launcher. And this is basically a desktop device built by one of my students, uh, Craig Alex Sheldon. Uh, all right, here she is. Uh, I'll in just all her glory. move this forward a little bit because uh, lots of explanation which are required from the course. Uh, so she's armed now. Peripherals are all isolated. Um, it says fire when ready. So, uh, moment of truth. Uh, firing in three, two, Okay, so he, he uh, Alex built that, uh, you know, basically out of uh, dustbin lids and God knows what else. Um, and it shows you that, you know, what by taking a simple approach to things, things don't have to be as complex as they are currently. One of the one of the philosophies we have to consider is current approaches to ISIU is to take stuff that was built on Earth supported by enormous infrastructure, a uh, global infrastructure of supply, put that on the moon and expect it to work. That is not the right way to industrialize the moon. The way to industrialize the moon, in my opinion, is to utilize the resources that are there and to build up simply. Things may not be perfect, they not, may not be optimized, but as long as they work, that's what matters. And then we can roll out, you know, generations of refinements and so on and so forth but focus but be using the resources that we have on the moon rather than actually trying to uh, transport earth technology to the moon without all the global support infrastructure that it, that it that it requires so i'm interested in actually building eventually uh some kind of prototype of a solar power satellite i'm not talking about the huge ones that we're talking the the NASA uh, SPS reference model, model, of course, is one of the huge ones, 250 tons. Uh, what I want you to look at, though, <coughs> is the major components. And there are four major components. You've got the PV array. Uh, again, I'm not looking at PV arrays. We're looking at thermionic conversion. Uh, a klystron or magnetron, uh, a microwave transmit antenna. Uh, which then beams microwave to the ground to a passive rectangular array. What we're focused on is uh, on the, um, the magnetron and also on the <clears throat> one part of this is because the arrays have to be pointed to the sun and the microwave antenna has to be pointed to the earth, there has to be a joint, a rotary joint uh, connecting the two. And of course, we've looked at rotary joints, they're called electric motors. So global energy consum consumption is about 15 terawatts. 
<clears throat> um, I've calculated the constellation of uh, just over well, two billion small satellites, uh, one square meter in size, uh, can generate 15 terawatts. This would form a geo ring uh, about one kilometer wide. Uh, and this would provide, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year uh, energy to Earth uh, or anywhere on Earth. Um, and the ring would be invisible to the naked eye. Uh, by employing lots of small satellites, it's highly redundant. It offers graceful rate degradation. Um, the approach is different because we're using Fresnel lens concentrators with thermionic conversion. And potentially, we can eliminate fuel entirely by adopting solar, solar cell propulsion. Uh, and I'll just finish off with a, a rather more outrageous uh, idea of uh, the solar shield. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the geoengineering techniques which most people think is, is, is uh, science fiction. I beg to differ. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, it doesn't directly uh, interact chemically with the Earth's atmosphere, which virtually all other techniques do. And it's controllable and modulatable and fully reversible unlike most of the other techniques which basically emit stuff into the atmosphere and can't be can't be uh, um, can't be kind of like brought back so <clears throat> and again the idea is that we use a uh, uh, the original idea was a, a thousand kilometer diameter fresnel lens at the sun earth l1 point which would basically refract uh, solar energy to reduce solar flux by up to two percent another uh, approach was to a more distributed approach was an uncontrolled diffuse cloud of refracting glass discs. Now, this required the launch from Earth of one ton sticks of 800,000 discs every every five minutes for 10 years using 22 kilometer rail, long rail guns on Earth. By adopting the moon, uh, we could implement this actually far more readily uh, and uh, from from the moon than we can, than we can from Earth. Um, Though I wouldn't, I would implement something a bit more complex than uncontrolled discs. So I think uh, we can actually add uh, solar cells to provide some kind of uh, controllability. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And um, so basically, these are just two ideas that self-replication could potentially implement. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very informative. Um, okay. Then. Does. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, like I mentioned, you can drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Uh, I can start with a very uh, simple question. So yeah. you showed the video of uh, a machine working with the parts built by a 3D printer. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how long it takes to actually print those individual parts. Uh, good question. Um, the, the actual structures were not the difficult part. The hardest part was that were the, were the coils. Mm -hmm. And they took a lot of care because, because they're very thin and we were doing it manually. Uh, so once you cut them and got, you know, you got the wires, you have to extract them from the, from the, from the, from the base, uh, from the, from the work platform. And that, takes a lot of ginger effort. Uh, I do have a video of someone doing that, uh, showing you how that's done. Um, the other, the I don't, I can't tell you how long it took to manufacture the magnets because that was done by Oak Ridge. Um, they have patented, you know, techniques there. Um, I would imagine that the, the most difficult part would have been the magnetization of the, because uh, you need very high fields. Uh, to magnetize the magnets. And um, another question I had uh, was about the uh, burning the lunar water um, to use it as oxidizer. You mentioned that it's like a non-renewable um, uh, method uh, for you know making the oxidizer. Yeah. Um, but is it uh, preferred over the solar um, energy derived power? Uh, yes, well, as you're probably aware, that uh, everybody wants to go to the moon, and what they want to do is mine the water. Uh, that, that, and the reason they want to mine the water is to burn its propellant, uh, not to support human bases, because the amount of the amount you need for human bases is relatively small. Uh, it's not very large. Uh, 
um, and techniques for recycling are actually very good. They've been developed during the ISS and so on. So you get fairly high recycling efficiency. Um, the primary goal for lunar ice is to split it into hydrogen and oxygen as a cryogenic propellant oxidizer mm -hmm. and store it and launch it to the gateway <clears throat> and store it there ready for basically to support a one or more human missions to Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, now, although each individual mission will not consume that much in terms of the amount of resources that are there, um, my concern is that if we start to, <clears throat> once you start factoring the private sector, um, I believe that once we start doing ISRU on the moon, that the, there'll be more and more people coming to the moon. Uh, and it will grow. And once it grows, demand will grow. And to me, that that's a mistake. I think that's a, that consuming all that water, it'll never come back. If we want to use the water, we should ensure that we recycle it. And you can do that use, using things like, uh, you know, through um, uh, uh, closed loop um, ecological life support systems, you recycle everything. Um, but burning it means it's gone. Mm. And I think we should be concentrating on developing electromagnetic launches, which eliminates that need for launching things from the moon, consuming uh, hydrogen oxygen. But my view is very unpopular. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for providing us this perspective.